Hello all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to this uh, first chapter of this webinar series, which is co-hosted by ACL Digital and Phoenix AI Tech, focusing on the future of AI-powered drones, right? So in today's uh, session, our focus would be to primarily to touch upon the, the current uh, use cases that is prevalent in the drone industry and what are the kind of problem statements that today typically people are seeing around and how AI as a, as a technology is going to solve this problem and how ACL Digital and Phoenix AI Tech are coming together to solve this challenging issue in the industry. So can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So primary idea of today's call uh, is to actually go through the uh, couple of use cases that we see in the industry and uh, also to touch upon uh, the key uh, uh, challenges that we see. We have also had a couple of demos that we wanted to showcase as part of this uh, webinar, which kind of gives a high level view of how we are trying to solve the problem. And followed by a brief uh, introduction of Phoenix AI Tech as a company and ACL Digital and how we are coming together to solve these use cases. At the end, we have a QA uh, session open up where we could take possibly the questions. Right. So that's how we have planned for today. Can we go to the next slide? So a brief introduction on the speakers for today's call. Uh, we have doc Dr. Craig, who is the co-founder and VP of R&D for Phoenix AI. He has a doctorate in mathematics and a, is a machine learning expert. We also have Mr. Rajesh Rasalkar, who is the co-founder and chief strategy officer for Phoenix AI Tech. He's an industry veteran, been in the industry for 20 plus years in all the industries that you can think about. We also have Dr. Vignesh, who is again the co-founder and CTO for Phoenix AI Tech and has a doctorate in antenna management. And myself, I'm part of ACL Digital. I had the sales and business development for ACL Digital here in North America. With this, I will actually hand it over to Vignesh to kind of get a little bit deep onto the use cases and typical industry challenges that we see and how we are gonna solve the problem. Over to you, Vignesh. Thanks a lot, Arunesh. Um, so greetings to everybody. Uh, this is Vignesh, I'm the CTO of Phoenix AI. Uh, and I welcome you to this webinar series where we're highlighting how artificial intelligence can combine with drone technology so that we can actually develop intelligent drones that can make smart decisions in real time as they fly. So it's a multi-part webinar and today you know, we're just going to focus on the route optimization problem for AI, especially in beyond visual line of sight environment. But then in, in future uh, webinar sessions, uh, we want to also highlight on the current challenges that the drone industry is facing, uh, then successful use cases, a part of it would get covered in today's webinar as well some ethical considerations uh, when we talk about using AI with drones and future advancements that we can expect uh, when we fuse this drone and artificial intelligence technology. Yeah, next slide. So this is just um, an overarching view of drone technology as we have today. Today, most of the drones are actually flown in visual line of sight, meaning the operator has a remote control and the drone can only fly within the visual limits of the drone operator. This severely limits the potential of drones and the extent to which drones can be deployed. In fact, with this visual line of sight kind of approach, uh, the drones can only fly to a maximum of 500 meters away from the, the uh, operator. From there, we go on to extended visual line of sight, which is sort of coming up today, where we use a combination of visual line of sight as well as a cellular uh, infrastructure connection to slightly increase the range of these drones from 500 meters to three kilometers. But then where uh, Phoenix AI really comes in is this domain of beyond visual line of sight, which is critical to 
uh, to realize the full potential of drones today. In beyond visual line of sight, the operator can be hundreds of miles away from the drone and the drones communicate back to the operator by uh, connecting to the cellular infrastructure, which is the cellular base stations, um, et cetera. So this is where you know, we are coming in as a company and trying to combine our expertise in the wireless domain with our expertise in the artificial intelligence and machine learning domain to come up with innovative solutions that can make drones intelligent so that we can navigate the scope of beyond visual line of sight um, and also navigate autonomously. Yeah, next slide. So the drone market is an amazing market today. You know, uh, the global commercial drone uh, operation market was actually estimated at 24.39 billion in 2022. And it has a very aggressive growth rate of 46% and is expected to grow to almost 500 billion in the next decade, in the next decade or so. You know, as we'll highlight a little later, we have last mile package delivery, remote infrastructure inspections, et cetera. All these industries are being revolutionized by drones as we speak. And many of the, the operations that were previously considered as impossible are now being made possible through drone technology. In fact, there's a very good comment by Goldman Sachs that actually compares drones to internet and GPS. That's the amount of impact drones are expected to have on the market as we go forward. And really, it's it, it's really the next revolution uh, in technology as we see as a company. Yeah, next slide. So this is our main problem statement and how what we are really bringing to the table as far as drones are concerned. So when we talk about beyond visual line of sight, the key to beyond visual line of sight is a very strong reliable, robust connectivity between the drones and the base station, right? Now you can think about the, this question, right? Now what's the big deal? I mean, our cellular phones are very well connected, right? We get connectivity most places that we go to. Um, so what's the big deal with drones? Well, the thing is your phones get good connectivity because the base station antenna beams are actually pointing towards your phones, right? And these phones are on the ground. In contrast, these drones are flying in the air. And when they fly in the air, they communicate to the base station by what is what we call side lobes of the antenna beam, which is basically you know, very low power, highly fluctuative antenna, uh, very fluctuative radiation patterns that are being used to communicate. Which means mobile networks are really not optimized to serve airborne equipment. And actually the drones can go through very quick uh, zones of good signal, bad signal, good signal, bad signal. And this can wreak havoc with the connection between the drone and the base station. So the first key challenge in beyond visual line of sight is reliable connectivity. Second is once the drone is actually flying miles away from the operator and nobody's really able to see the drone in that sense, we want to make sure that these drones are flying only in safe and authorized areas. It should not fly over congested areas, it should not fly over people, and it should not fly over zones that FAA has already condemned as no-fly zones. Right? So safety becomes the next important consideration for beyond visual line of sight. Third is that the drones should be able to detect and avoid obstacles as it flies. Right, It should not collide with birds. It should not collide with other flying objects. It should not collide with uh, buildings, etc. And fourth is the battery. Right, when, Once the drones is flying uh, autonomously, we want to make sure that the drones can fly as long as possible so that we can get a lot more juice out of the drone technology and finally make a lot more money out of this technology uh, you know, to, to realize the full potential of this drone. So where do we come in? We empower the drone to make real-time decisions. That's the key, right? The drone is not being trained, the drone is not really being set to make preconceived you know, decisions even before it flies, no. We just put a training model on the drone, right? And the drone, as it flies, is able to look at the wireless channel, wireless channel conditions and, and in real time, take a decision on what is the next heading to, to, to take so that it can actually avoid zones of low coverage and always be in regions of good coverage. We only sense the wireless power, which means we are actually independent of uh, the technology that is being used, whether it's Wi-Fi, cellular, satcom. We really don't care because we don't care about demodulating the signal and interpreting it. We just care about the power levels. 
Secondly, we are actually sensing the signal to interference ratio, which basically means that if the drone is able to fly near a congested zone, the cellular users on the floor or on the ground will actually provide a lot of interference to this drone, which will degrade the signal to interference ratio and the drone would automatically avoid this. So as a very nice byproduct of what we are trying to do, the drone will automatically steer clear of these congested zones. And finally, since we always keep the drones in the in regions of good connectivity, uh, the drone can actually maintain good throughput while radiating you know, the minimal amount of power. Also, you know, there is another very important uh, factor called handoff, where you know we where uh, where the drone actually has to cut its connection with the current base station and make a new connection to the next base station, uh, which is very uh, prevalent when the drone flies in the sky because of the fact that the signals fluctuate very rapidly. So we optimize this as well, as we'll see soon, right? And when we do this, uh, automatically, we also conserve battery life. And we do all this uh, while ensuring that the distance, the overall distance that the drone travels between A and B is also optimized so that you know overall, the battery life can be improved and, and enhanced beyond visual line of sight operations. Uh, next slide. Okay, yeah, so how do we do this and how do we prove our algorithm, right? Uh, so this is what I was talking about. Uh, if you look at the radiation pattern, which is on the top left figure, you can actually see the a representative radiation pattern from the drone, from a, from a cellular base station. And you can see the main beam serves the, the user on the ground, but then you have all these side lobes that are used to communicate to the drone. So all these patterns, and, uh, include, and also you include sectorization, uh, drone altitude, scheduling, interference, all that comes in as an inbuilt RF channel simulator, which we have developed uh, at Phoenix AI, which, which gets uh, a map, a heat map that we can feed to the RL algorithm that actually runs queue-based learning in the background and finally gives us a trained model and finally gives us the optimized route. So this is the overall flow that we are using at this point to validate and to showcase our algorithm. Um, next slide. So let's consider uh, a real-time uh, case or a real-time situation, right? Uh, so this considers a suburban area, which is Rockville uh, near, uh, situated in Maryland, United States. And you can see those yellow markers there, those are actually T-Mobile base stations. So we can actually get these base station maps online today. And you can see there are two maps that I have on the right-hand side, which is the coverage map and the base station map. Uh, let's uh, spend a minute and just understand these maps. So when, you, when I talk about coverage maps, I take all these base station locations into our RF simulator and then simulate what is the kind of coverage that I'll get at every drone location. So the way to read this map is red is zone of good coverage, blue is zone of bad coverage. So we want the drone to spend maximum amount of time in the red or the yellow zones and avoid the blue zones. Now, as you can see, the red curve is the straight path and the black curve is our optimized path. And as you can see, the, the optimized path, which is the black curve, very intelligently takes very minute deviations on the straight line path, just so that it can always be in zones of good connectivity. Now, if you come to the other color map at the bottom of the screen, we actually have what is called the base station map. And the base station map actually shows which base station is serving the drone at every location. So the way we interpret this map is that every time the color of the, of the map changes, there is a handoff where the drone actually has to cut its connection with the current base station and then make a new connection with another base station. Now, as you can see, uh, if we, if we just go on a straight line path because of the fact that there are side lobes uh, of the base station, we get very rapid fluctuations in the signal, which causes the drones to think that it should now make a new connection to a new base station. In fact, if you count all the, all the handoffs or the number of handoffs that the drone has to make from source to destination on the red path, it's actually 31 handoffs, which is a lot considering the fact that they're only navigating a space of about 10 kilometers here. However, if you, if you think, uh, if, if you look at the black path, just the optimized path, you see again, you know, our algorithm is able to make very minute decisions uh, uh, and, and have very minute 
kind of deviations from the straight line path, which reduces the handoff all the way from 31 to 17. So it's almost a 2x reduction in handoff, which is a big deal for us because reducing handoffs automatically guarantees good connectivity and good battery life, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a, a summary of, you know, our, our algorithm and how intelligently, you know, our, our drone can get equipped to make these decisions real time. Uh, and now from here, I'll, I'll hand it off to Craig to highlight how we are actually going to get this algorithm in the drone um, and actually demonstrate uh, it in hardware. Yeah, Craig. All right, thanks for that, Ignash. That was a great explanation. So hi, everybody. I'm Craig. I'm the head of R&D for Phoenix AI. So what I'm going to do is expand a little bit on basically the last slide that Vignesh presented about how we're doing our route optimization. So the steps that are involved in, in really implementing and validating this reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, the first step you can think of is just entirely based in uh, a certain software environment where we look at the result of these paths and evaluate them against, say, the naive path, the straight line path between two points. The second step of this is to take these algorithms and adapt them to some kind of uh, high quality, high fidelity simulation. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's called robot operating system. So robot operating system or ROS, this is a popular uh, software development kit for interacting with drones. And what this is used for is we've adapted our software so that the interactions that we're gonna have with ROS in this high fidelity simulation, these will be the same, it'll be the same software really that we deploy on the drone itself when we do our real world testing. So you see this kind of toy figure here we have about how drones and our software interact with one another. So on the left-hand side, um, you see, What's happening is we have the drone itself has a certain autopilot software and there we go. <laughs> so the drone itself has certain autopilot software and what we're using is what's called the, the PX4 autopilot. This is a very popular and common uh, autopilot system that's found on a wide range of drones. Uh, also equipped on the drone are certain sensors like cameras, or LiDAR sensors, uh, sensors like the inertial measurement unit reporting the position of, of the drone, its velocity, acceleration, et cetera. So these things that are on the drone, they are communicated to our software via these, these ROS messages. So robot operating system employs a, a, what you might think of as a bunch of nodes, and these nodes communicate with one another. They communicate with each other via these messages that are these talking messages or listening messages. These are called publishers and subscribers. So in our software, what we set up is using these standard messages to communicate from the drone to our software. So the first line of communication goes from the drone to our software and where we're communicating uh, position, velocity, acceleration type information via the IMU. And we're also communicating, importantly, the, the wireless channel link quality. So this feeds into our software. Once those things are ingested by our software, um, in that moment, so you can think about, we're, we're talking about some time-based process. So in that moment, our software takes these readings and turns that around and communicates back to the autopilot. So the autopilot sends back to the drone or sorry, the, the software sends back to the autopilot a command in that moment for what it should be doing. So you might think of the command uh, could be the communication of going to a certain waypoint as it has ingested uh, this information. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so we're talking about this high fidelity simulation I'm about to present to you. But an important part of this is that the, the simulation that we've developed uh, is the same exact software that we're going to be deploying on our own drone. So we have uh, our own drone from Modal AI. And you can see here on the left-hand side, sort of the, the setup of how these things can communicate with one another. Uh, so we have our 
our, our test environment. Um, and what we'll be doing very soon is taking the results of the simulation I'm about to show you on the next slide and deploying this on our drone. Again, this is by means of robot operating system and its, its system of publishers and subscribers to communicate from the drone uh, to our own software. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, uh, Craig, just sorry, uh, just to interject here, I just want to mm -hmm. tell the audience to, you know, you are able to actually type in the question and answers. I mean, to type your questions on the Q&A section um, on Zoom, and we'll be able to see it, and we'll be able to take those questions either during the talk, if it's relevant, or we can, we'll, we'll answer your questions after the, the webinar. So please use the Q&A button on Zoom to type in your questions. Yeah, Craig, please continue, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, Big Nash, great point. Yeah, please ask us questions about this. We're happy to, to talk about this. Okay, so before, before we play the video, let me just tell you what you're about to see. You can kind of see in the still on the right-hand side a little bit about what's about to happen. So in the still on the right-hand side, the left side of the screen is showing you, uh, you can maybe see this in the beginning, this little dot in the, the center of the left-hand panel, that's a simulated drone. This is a, an environment called Gazebo. So Gazebo is a high fidelity simulation environment for robots, it's often used with drones. What it has is uh, simulated physics for the drone. And again, it's using robot operating systems so we can, we can communicate with it the same way that we're gonna be commuting with or communicating with the drone in real life. We're sending it the same exact messages and it, it'll respond uh, in a way that is uh, reliable that we can use to uh, be pretty confident that what we do in this sort of simulation is what's going to happen in the real world. All right, <clears throat> if you could start the video on the left, yeah. Okay, so did a screen capture here of the simulation. And if you could just pause the video for a second. Let's see what happens. Okay. Okay, great. So what's it? So we're paused here. The drone's about to take off in a second. And so what you're seeing on the right hand side we're gonna see a visualization of the heat map. And so what I mean by the heat map here is the drone is reading at different points of its flight. It's reading um, the SINR values from its eye or from its sensors. So you see this little green sphere here that's appearing. This is a representation of the SINR value it's reading. And so the, the colors here are actually the same as the colors that Vignesh was showing before. Uh, so this reading of greenish is not that great. It's starting in a region, <clears throat> excuse me, where the signal is not that great. It wants to be in a region where the signal is good. That would be red. So this is going to fly basically on just a straight line path from between two points. It's a relatively short path. And so if you can hit play on the video, we'll just watch. This is the naive path. We'll see what happens as it flies. Now what's about to appear on the right-hand side in the corner is the mean SINR that it's observing. So the mean SINR, this is a, a rolling average of the SINR. So what's important here is at the very end of its flight, that's the key value that we need to see. So it's flying, it's entering this region of good connectivity in red. It started out in a region that wasn't so great, but it's flying in this basically straight line path. See the mean SINR changing. And we're just recording the mean SINR while it's flying. We're actually not recording it while it's taking off or while it's landing. We have to see the end. Okay, so our drone is flying. Again, uh, red regions are good. But of course, this drone is just flying, flying in a straight line path. So it doesn't have any, it's not making any choices about in the moment, what to do. It's just observing. So when the drone lands, the mean SINR calculation is going to stop and we're gonna just gonna note what that value is. Okay, so it's getting near the end of its flight. 
Like I said, this is a relatively short flight for this drone. Then when it gets to its destination, it's just going to land. Okay, so the mean SINR here, this is over the entire flight. We have a value of 48.9. Okay, so 48.9. What we're gonna do now is compare that to uh, when the drone is trained using our algorithm on the same two points, we're gonna see what happens, what decisions it makes and how it improves the SINR, the mean SINR over the entire flight. So the drone is navigating between the same two points. Okay, so the drone takes off in the same position as it was in the straight line path. And now we're looking at the mean SINR just on the, the, the portion of the flight, not involving takeoff or landing. So the drone actually has already de deviated from the straight line path somewhat at the very beginning. And you see this little elbow in the path, it's made a choice in the moment to make it a, to fly to a different waypoint because it's expecting higher SINR values to be achieved by making these deviations. So again, these deviations are being made on the fly as it makes observations about the link quality. So it's entering this region of high SINR. And you can see that the mean SINR that we're achieving uh, is already quite a bit higher than it was with the naive straight line path. So it spends a long time in this red region. So it's nearing the end of its path. And recall that the SINR that we achieved uh, on the straight line path uh, over the whole flight was 48.9. And now with our algorithm, we achieved uh, a much higher average SINR, 59.9 by making these small deviations. So of course we've added to the distance that's being traveled. However, we've made a great improvement uh, in the mean SINR. So again, just to emphasize the point that this high fidelity simulation and the, the software that we're using here, this is the same software that we're gonna be using in our real life testing on the drone. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so I'll hand over now and thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Craig. I think that was super exciting. And uh, you know, we are actually marching towards uh, a, a hardware implementation where we are, we are actually taking this, I mean, we've already validated it on the software environment. We're just going to take it and put it um, in the in an actual drone and hopefully, you know, recover the exact path and the exact behavior that our simulations are reporting. And from here, um, I'm able to march on to some use cases. And as you, know, you can imagine, you know, our algorithm is actually, you know, a, it can actually become an integral part of drone operation. There is like no application which our algorithm cannot support when it comes to drone use cases. Now we have a, a big section for drones to be, uh, which are used in inspection. It can be oil and gas, electric utilities, rails and roads, etc. Where you know we have to inspect uh, you know a, a certain area. Now when we do that, obviously the route is almost fixed. It can't make major deviations. The, the 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 thing to inspect still has to be within the field of view of the drone. However, as we've already seen before, we can actually have our algorithm make very minute deviations to the straight line path and, and get good connectivity while keeping the required object within field of view. So what can happen now is that as this drone is taking in huge amounts of data, it could be video, it could be images, it can use that high connectivity spot and just you know uh, and just transfer all the all the high 
uh, on the content, uh, which can be gigabytes or terabytes in size, all to the cloud in real time as it flies, because it's always flying in regions of good connectivity. And also, of course, the command and carry channel is also uh, guaranteed to be good because we're always flying in zones of good connectivity. We also come in for deliveries uh, and medical services because these kind of uh, these kind of use cases require uh, a very uh, optimal delivery in terms of distance. So in general, you know, our code can can weight these things differently. So for these kind of uh, uh, for these kinds of applications, you know, we can prioritize distance over the SINR or the handoff or something like that, right? Uh, and similarly for agriculture. So finally, you know, key takeaway is that whether it's oil and gas, electric utilities, rails and roads, deliveries, agriculture, you name it, you know, our algorithm can come in and bring new capabilities to all of these business uh, and industry and really usher in the next generation of drone technology, uh, you know, uh, in the modern era. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I think from here, uh, I'll, I'll hand the mic over to Rajesh, who will take over, who will take us over the formation of our company, et cetera. Yeah, Rajesh. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, or uh, good afternoon. Uh, so thank you, Craig, for the great demo, and thank you, Vignesh, for explaining the problem statement for the drone operating autonomously to drive the various use cases. Um, so, so I shall take only a few minutes to talk about the our company and the team. So uh, can you go to next slide? Yeah, so we are based in uh, Sunnyvale, California. We are specialized in AIML-based software developments, not only for the autonomous drone in beyond visual line of sight operations, but we are also looking at advanced use case of AIML for like CV2X, uh, which is a cellular vehicle to everything to allow vehicles to communicate directly with other vehicles like V2V, a V2I, which is a vehicle to infrastructure, or V2P, uh, which is a vehicle to the road users uh, with low latency messages to drive the application that can have a, like immediate safety benefits. Uh, in addition, we are also exploring the use case of AIML in other areas such as analytics frameworks, spectrum sharing, uh, which are part of the, the SIGG efforts uh, as defined by the 3GP standards. And as Craig has shown uh, how our software can easily integrate into the drone uh, at operating systems and controls the autopilot. So we have very unique advantage is that like it is a hardware agnostic solutions. So we don't have any hardware. Uh, we are building that whole AML software that integrates into the drone. It's very lightweight, the, the whole uh, the ML algorithms. Uh, so it can integrate any types of IoT devices, correct? It could be, I means I think we talked about drone or the unmanned aerial vehicles here, but it can also integrate into robotics or flying cars, any devices, correct? That needs to operate in autonomously. Uh, so, uh, so basically, so if any anyone is looking to operate in like autonomous mode, uh, I think our software can fit their needs without requiring any forms of spatial configuration or changes. Uh, regarding company, uh, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix AI is a spin-off of Dalartec, uh, which is, Dalartec is a leading research and design engineering services firm established in, uh, I think in, uh, in 2017 in California. Uh, and again, we are proud to have a team of over like 100 plus uh, highly skilled engineers uh, and most of whom hold like advanced degrees from like top research institutes. So at our core, we are like committed to like creating a next generation consumer oriented devices that are perfectly aligned with like new sets of like metaverse concepts. So our focus is on developing like cutting edge AR smartwatches, VR glasses, extended devices that offer like immersive experience to the users. Uh, so our team expertise enable us to like maybe like deliver the top like like new types of solution for new sets of the problems. Uh, regarding our team, uh, again, we are a power of also diverse like industry experts with proven track record of building the products. We have combination of both research scientists as well as business experts. And we bring like unique perspective the, the, to build like next generation products. So our experience spans across like startups, multinational companies, so during the call, uh, you have met Dr. Craig, who is in charge of the R&D, and Dr. Vignesh, our CTO. 
Dr. Ritten is also on this call and he leads uh, the engineering activities. Uh, he's actually leading the test activities to fly the drone uh, in the field in California. And I, as I explained by the Craig, correct? So we are very close putting to put our software on the drone, actual drone, uh, which is a Sentinel drone uh, from model AI based on the Qualcomm uh, design uh, to control the autopilots and the and actually to fly the drone autonomously in the air. So if you are interested in learning the integration of the drone and beyond visual of line of sight components, the wireless modem chipsets, please reach out to Ritain or one of us. Uh, we'll be happy to talk to you more about our experience on flying the drone autonom autonomously. Um, again, aside from our founding team, again, we have very diverse technical committee made up of a range of industry experts. Um, the team consists of, again, research scientists uh, with business experts uh, who have a deep understanding of startup and multinational companies. I think we have J.D. Pranadi. He's a seasoned professional with almost 25 years of experience working in Silicon Valley. Um, I think he has worked with well-known companies like which Qualcomm, Apple, Meta, to develop advanced wireless products. Uh, he has been in the industry again, uh, he's, uh, and he has, I think with all these companies, uh, he has delivered like high quality, both hardware and software products uh, for consumer oriented devices. Uh, currently he's leading Phoenix AI, the team here to with the product roadmap and the go-to-market strategy. And then we have Dr. Arup Bhuen, uh, He's a wireless researcher and extensive industry experience in wireless communications. And the focus of his uh, research is on the secure implementation of future generation wireless communications. And uh, in terms of uh, cybersecurity, uh, he's a senior member of IEEE. And uh, he provides technical input to Phoenix uh, in terms of security mechanism in wireless environments. Uh, that are applicable for the unmanned area, area, aerial vehicle systems. Uh, can you go to next slide? Um, as you know, like a drone uh, industry or the ecosystem is still developing. Uh, there are challenges, difficulties in integrating the drone technology to operate in the beyond visual of, visual line of sight. Um, and this requires like a lot of system integration efforts from companies such as Phoenix AI, ACL Digital, uh, who has like deep expertise in telecom, uh, aerospace, OSS, BSS, and, and also AIML. Uh, and as the market uh, continues to mature, I think more value will be placed on the software, particularly on the turnkey solution that to enhance like unmanned aerial, aerial vehicle systems operations. Um, so again, we are here actually, we are making the drone to fly autonomously. And uh, we have in-depth knowledge of wireless telecom satellite industry. And we have held like a uh, number of our customers with embedded ML algorithm, physical layer, uh, stack development for cellular, which could be 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. Uh, we have done antenna design, characterizations, RF board design, DSP designs, again, which are very crucial components in developing a commercial grade products or the drone. Uh, so please reach out if you need any uh, additional information from uh, Phoenix AI teams. Uh, next, I'll invite Arunesh to give overview about his company and how they help customers with their challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, thank you. So I'll take a little bit pause here to just give an idea about uh, ACL Digital. And uh, ACL Digital is part of Alton Group. We are a French headquartered company. It presents in around uh, like 30 plus countries. Uh, we work with around 6,500 clients globally. And we are around 57,000 people, right? And uh, we, are, we are like third engineering services company in the world in terms of uh, skill, capability, and also the domains that we work on. And we go to the next slide. A little bit about ACL Digital. ACL Digital, as we call, is a niche arm of Alton, focusing on high-tech industry, specifically on the telecom, the semiconductor, the embedded. And if you, if you look at it from an industry perspective, you know, we have been along with the customers in the journey, being act, acting more from a, not just from a, some a resourcing partner, 
we have played more from a deep engineering perspective we have been part of some of the uh, customer developments in the aerospace uh, with with the likes of both boeing airbus even in automotive we work with all the t1 oems that you can see talk about we work with all the semiconductor companies that you kind of typically see so if you look at it we have been historically enabling customers uh, based from the platform to all the way to the cloud so we call ourselves as a chip to cloud company and we are very fortunate to have partnered with uh, you know phoenix ai tech and the idea uh, when when you know the team uh, we came together our interest was to make sure that the you know innovation that you know is being carried over by phoenix ai we wanted to reach as many you know new new customers uh, as much as we can by enabling this technology which which is is something a very need in every industry that you see and as as you know as rajesh just informed it's not just drone so we work on the autonomous car we do expand of an environment and that's where you know we we feel phoenix ai is one of the valuable partners for us uh, in the in the coming journey uh, next slide so this is a high level view of the industries that we touch upon we are everywhere uh, in, from an industry perspective and uh, specifically from a from a high tech industry perspective you know we have been we have been serving all the on the all the uh, in a new age technologies that you can think about we are on the cloud we are on high tech we are on the layer one you know and the the niche that uh, phoenix ai tech carries is something that we always love to carry to our customers and that's where the partnership is doing on well and i think uh, you know we will get to the next stage next slide so this is a high level view uh, of what are the services that we offer you know uh, from the from the more from a product conceptualization to the end of where you know we do the product rollout and the managed services we come in as a we come in as a product development partner uh, we come in as a testing development partner we come in as a system integrator we come as a professional services partner so we played very different roles in different companies and in 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 this in this game also we would love to play uh, our different faces of our overall offering and that's we are that that's how we feel that this engagement is going to go to the next level uh, with this uh, we've kind of come to the uh, last stage which is more about our reach from an uh, next slide our reach uh, from a from a global perspective uh, we are pretty much there in every place then on the globe and that's a scale that we carry and we uh, with the with the depth that we have in certain industries and in some places that we feel that we need to go one step ahead on the technology side we partner with uh, uh, the the great companies like phoenix ai tech that we see today with this uh, we have come to the end of the webinar and then we'll open the open the q and a uh, and i will pass it on to rajesh to just touch upon the questions that has been on the chat window and we can take it from there thank you uh, thank you arinesh uh, thank you for uh, great insights into acl digital uh, i think there are a couple of questions on the chat uh, uh, maybe I'll, i think there is first one from atul thank you atul for attending the call uh, i think the question is with a new flight the flight time increase which will lead to more use of battery and doesn't this will nullify the effect of improved battery using better sinr uh, maybe craig i know you have answered it i don't think it's yeah. visible to everyone so why don't you take yeah yeah this is this is a great question i'm i'm glad you asked this question um the the thing is though um there are going to be other competing objectives that have to be satisfied in the drone flight so the the what i mentioned here and the answer was imagine some kind of scenario where the drone has to, to stream some high quality video as it's flying. Uh, and it has to maintain a certain signal quality to do that. So the unoptimized path can't take that into consideration. It could enter some region where that's not possible to meet that objective. So this is just one, one example where we the power consideration is important, but it also has to be balanced against the, the mission objectives themselves being satisfied. So that's but 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 that's a great question now and i guess i would just like to add to what uh, greg said here uh, also you know we can actually optimize our algorithm so that it doesn't deviate too much from the straight line path so you know we just 
deviate a little from the straight line path as a little bit of distance. But for that little bit of distance, we are actually minimizing the number of handoffs by more than a factor of two, and we're getting good signal quality. So, so automatically, you know, the little that we might lose in uh, in in distance and battery, we might be able to make up for, for it on even more in terms of signal connectivity and throughput and uh, the RF complexity that we need to undergo on the route. So. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and I think the next question is from Boris. Uh, thank you, Boris, for attending. Uh, what is your approach to in to the integration of these capabilities into different existing UTM con ops? Uh, you can actually want to take it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so for uh, the existing UTM, right? So essentially, um, the fact of the matter is that our algorithm is pretty independent of the protocol that we use. It is four G, five G, cellular. SATCOM, Wi-Fi, uh, it doesn't really matter because we are only sensing the power levels. We aren't going to decoding and all that. Um, so finally, you know, it doesn't matter what protocol we use, right? This, this algorithm would still be very much relevant. Uh, the only thing to, to consider is that what kind of KPIs can get exposed at the network level based on the MNO that we are working with. And if they can expose more uh, KPIs like latency, throughput, and other things, then we can incorporate that also into our ML code to make it even more resilient and even more uh, applicable. Thank you. Uh, I think the next one is, what are the current challenges faced by the drone industry and how can uh, AI potentially address them? Maybe I'll, I can add some uh, uh, some input here. I think there are a number of challenges with the industry and um, I think overall industry. And I know there are a lot of uh, industry players are trying to solve the various problem statements of the drone industry, right? So, and I think our approach is more on the, based on AI assistant, uh, basically we're trying to use some of the AI capabilities. Uh, so even if you consider like a regulatory, regulatory compliance, correct? So I think if you are navigating like complex regulations related to uh, airspace, privacy, safety, uh, there are significant challenges um, and uh, our AI assistant software could help by simulating like scenarios, generating optimal path, uh, flight paths uh, that comply with regulations. Um, for instance, like in the US, correct, FAA has a very strict rules for the drone operations. And, uh, and there are a lot of uh, discussion around safety and the uh, collision avoidance. And so basically drone must avoid like collision with other objects. So AI can help by predicting the potential ob obstacles, maybe generating real time strategies to avoid them and improve the safety. Um, then I think the next challenge is more like the battery and the energy efficiency, correct? So there is limited battery uh, life, correct? That restricts the drone to operate. Uh, probably the drone, I think right now it applies like 20 to 30 minutes. So the whole AI could help, correct? Not only to optimize and as Vignesh has mentioned, correct? In terms of uh, like maybe taking shortest path or making taking the path that has optimized uh, Handoffs like handovers, correct? So, which consume a lot of battery, could be a good uh, in uh, good use case of the AI. And there are some data processing and uh, the edge edge computing use case, correct? So, which I know we have not touched on this one, but that's very important topic here, where you can upload some of the uh, the data processing at the edge of the network based on AI capabilities. And then I think lastly, there are some security challenges. So again, drones are very vulnerable to the hacking. Uh, so I think AI can uh, create more issues or more challenges for security, but it can also help some of the security challenges. Uh, I think the next one uh, is, uh, I think, I don't know who asked it, but uh, I think it's a big question. Um, do you maybe, uh, Vignesh, do you want to maybe summarize uh, regarding the FA and the uh, ICO. Sure, yeah. So, so that is something on the regulation side, which uh, is a very relevant question and something that we are keeping a very keen eye on. Uh, because as the regulations evolve, the safe flying zones and the no fly zones would all, you know, be uh, a very relevant thing. And how those safe fly zones and no fly zones work with SINR quality, the link quality, etc., is something that we have to um, see, you know, as we head into the future. One thing for sure is that our algorithm is extremely capable in taking these safe fly and no fly zones into training. So even pre-flight, you would actually train these drones to fly only in 
you know, the, the safe fly zones and totally avoid the no fly zone corridor. So that is something which we've already incorporated into our code. And we're just uh, monitoring the, the, the situation as far as the government resolutions are concerned. Yeah, and if I can just chime in, that's a good point that this this idea of safety corridors or no fly zones, uh, this this knowledge is actually already incorporated into the training of the algorithm so that we, we have some guarantees about uh, the drones not violating, for example, some kind of safety corridor in which it has to fly while also optimizing the route that it would take within that corridor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there are a number of which, and I don't think we'll have enough time. I think we have only four minutes. Maybe we'll take one or two. Uh, uh, I think the next one is um, how can AI improve the drone navigations and obstacle avoidance to enhance the safety and efficiency? Uh, maybe Craig, you, you want to give your input? Sorry, give me a, a second. I'm looking at the questions. Uh... Which yeah, question? it's how can how can AI improve the drone navigation and obstacle avoidance to enhance the safety and efficiency? Oh, uh, yes. So certainly, um, one thing, yeah, one thing I just mentioned, it, it can certainly optimize for safety uh, in the sense of flying or or being trained and only flying in say certain corridors, but also um, we we have uh, on sort of our roadmap ideas about incorporating this, uh, our solution into certain uh, DAA detect and avoid algorithms so that this can seamlessly work with the DAA algorithm um, that might make some choice, some overriding choice, a safety consideration choice uh, to, to deviate, uh, to avoid a collision, but um, with the input of our algorithm to do so in a way that uh, would meet our own goals say, of also trying to maximize the signal quality. So you can imagine that uh, a, a deviation as a result of a DAA command could be done in a number of different ways. And one way in which that could be done might be a way that maximizes uh, the link quality. Thank you, Craig. Uh, we have two minutes. Maybe we'll take one question. I think, uh, Amita, uh, Gosh, I think thank you for your questions. I know you have asked multiple questions. Maybe we'll take the first one and maybe we'll conclude. Uh, so I think the first one uh, from you was like with the improvement in S S SINR, SNR, do you have estimates on the improvement in uh, plane cover, average throughput for BV, BVLOS drone flights? So Vignesh, you want to take? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so this is again a very good question. So, uh, so it's highly dependent on the area that we fly in. So let's say if it's a very urban area, right, where there's a lot of base stations and a lot of interference, um, in, in this case, what would happen is that the SINR anyway is very low because of all the interference that you get from all the base stations. But the handoff is a bigger problem in these kind of urban settings, as you just saw when we spoke about the Maryland case. right? So in, in such situations, we can actually get very good SINR comparable to that of a straight line path. However, we actually reduce the handoffs by a big amount, by a factor of two or by, by a factor of three. And that's where our algorithm is shining. Whereas on the other hand, if it's a rural area where the base stations are spread further apart, this is where the SINR question would really come up. And in these situations, in, at least in simulated environments, we've seen huge improvements uh, in SINR in terms of our optimized link, uh, optimized route. It could be upwards of you know four to ten dB, depending on the kind of area that we are considering and the kind of interference models that uh, you know we are considering. So depending on the area. You know, we'll have these things. Now, the, the main point, and which also ties into some of the other questions, is that we actually don't have any measured heat maps for, uh, you know, drones flying at an altitude by the MNOs at this point. So we have to actually work very closely with the MNOs to actually see whether, you know, we can get these heat maps in some form or the other, and then correlate with our simulation and our training models so that, you know, when we actually deploy it, um, you know, in, in an actual you know, real-life scenario, we are actually, you know, working with some uh, real-time data, and this is something that we have to work towards, you know, as, you know, as a as a community. Thank you, Vignesh. And uh, I know we have a few other questions. We will take it offline. But uh, just to conclude, again, we are uh, we are currently on a journey to enable like drone to fly autonomously in like safe and secure manners. 
Um, but I want to take an opportunity to may, yeah, extend my congratulations to like whole ACL Digital for taking this initiative and publicly expressing their willingness to solve the challenges. I think which is a huge uh, task for the entire industry. So I'm confident like with ACL Digital and collaboration with Phoenix is I will basically solve some of the, this technical and regulatory ch challenges. So again, big shout out to the whole ACL Digital team for organizing this event. And Arunesh, do you want to say a few things? No, definitely, Rajesh. Uh, you know, this is a first of its kind where we are doing it together as a, as a joint webinar and more to follow. And uh, we would want to keep the audience and everybody looking forward uh, in the industry on the toes to see what we'll come up with the next uh, webinar series. So, and thanks to thanks to the entire team of Phoenix AI. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we are gonna see a lot more in improvements in the way that uh, we are going to come up uh, with uh, new, new versions of the webinar series that is gonna happen in the coming uh, quarters. Looking forward to that, uh, Rajesh, good to offer to everybody. And thanks to the entire audience who were there on the call today and really appreciate your time that you put forward uh, in coming together for this uh, uh, series, webinar series. Thank you.